Morning world, foggy lens. Morning Eddie! Oh my god! <laughs> I don't have to do it, sorry. <laughs> Morning so to you. Have a great day. I hate you. I was here yesterday and I'm here again. This time for the FinTech exchange by PayPal. So hopefully that's gonna be interesting. Hopefully that's gonna be fun or nice to watch. Vivian Balakrishna is going to speak, I think, or he's going to be there. And uh, Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. So hopefully that will be interesting. And hopefully they let me vlog. If not, you just like see a picture of their face or something. PayPal, and a whole lot of bouncers. So, yeah. Looks rather cool though. Check it out. Food over there. More food over there. And then they've got their incubator stuff over there. Showcases from some of the schools on that side. And the talks are going to happen over there later. So, looking forward. This afternoon, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister in Charge of the Smart Nation Initiative, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, is under PayPal's innovation lab. So, uh, that's oh, yeah. who we found. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, now he's going to sneak out on you, but no. Okay, space open. And oh, yeah. No, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to have a coffee and tea and join us right now. We'll see you shortly. Alright ladies and gentlemen, just taking... But you know what, today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have some time to really uh, get down and... Hello everyone. Alright, after this clip that you're watching now, um, we're going to have... Apple's co-founder Steve Wozniak's segment on PayPal's fintech exchange earlier today. Uh, so do watch that. For those of you who are not really interested because it's going to take 10 over minutes long um, that I edited in here. Um, so it's different clips of him talking. Quite interesting um, for those of you that are interested in startups and whatnot. Um, yeah. So if, for those of you who are not interested in watching, do just skip the whole thing and watch tomorrow's vlog instead. Uh, we will be back to our original nonsense content then. So, yeah. Now. Really, you know, creating the Apple One and the Apple Two and starting the whole personal computer thing, it really was a process that was well over a decade of my life, starting down in elementary school age, 10 years old, developing incredible love for computers when nobody could afford a computer. They cost millions of dollars. And then later in life, they cost as much as a house. And I became so skilled at designing on paper the pieces, the little tiny electronic parts that would make a computer. I would design them for fun almost every weekend. And I told my father, someday I'm going to own a 4K computer. <laughs> because a 4K is enough to run a program. And my father said it costs as much as a house. I was stunned, so I said, I'll live in an apartment. <laughs> I challenged him, and um, I wanted this computer. Now, my skills were pretty much, at a certain point in time, the parts had come down in price that made a personal computer possible to make that was affordable. Useful and affordable. Useful meant you could sit down and enter programs in without spending, you know, as much as a few cars worth of money to buy more parts. You could actually type a program in, run it, and see the output just like you could at the university. And affordable meant whatever you want to make. It means maybe in raw state it meant a few hundred dollars for the parts. Um, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars for a fully built machine was, was justifiable. And there were a bunch of people that were starting to try to make kits of parts that looked like computers. And they looked like the old computers that were intimidating with switches for ones and zeros and all that stuff. I had built my own one of those five years before. So I was kind of five years beyond where their thinking was. I had loved a computer and wanted one, and I built one for myself. I designed it, somebody gave me the parts I needed, and I built it. Affording the parts was the big problem. People have come and they have ideas of something that's never been done this way that'll make some part of life easier. 
And I hear an awful lot of those. And they start companies. And sometimes those companies, very often they fail. And every once in a while, I've been attracted to joining a company. Re in recent times, about five years ago, I joined a company called Fusion IO that basically had thought out the method to turn hard disks, spinning recorded data that stores all your stuff, turned into chips, NAND flash memory chips. Only everyone else in the world was doing it, but they, everyone was doing it one way. This company did it a different way. They plugged the chips right into the servers in the data centers. And I said, oh my gosh, that's the right architecture. That's the right approach that everyone else is missing. They're trying to build a disk out of the chips. We put the chips in a computer, and with software, it could be a disk. With software, it could be other things. It could be higher performance. And uh, it was the way I used to design. So I joined that company, and very successful. Um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Engineers spend so much of their life trying to get things down right and get it to work. And every time they do, their mind has improved and improved and improved. And they are very clever at solving problems, very clever at solving puzzles. And keep an engineer in defining what your product's going to be in its entirety. Find a very good engineer. And better yet, if you find a marketing person who wants it themselves, who wants it to be the best ever in the world, that has used similar things or bought similar things in their past, but says, I want it, but it's got to be so good that nobody else can do it better. You have to find these kind of people. Wanting to be the best in the world is a really, um, a really um, key issue here. You don't necessarily have to be instantaneous and fast. I, uh, I'm one of those people that likes to think things out, think things out, and by the time you have thought it out very thoroughly, actually building prototypes, even getting it to market can come very quickly. Well, I advise actually three aspects. A business person who wants to watch the profits and the revenues, an engineer who can innovate and come up with clever ideas and solutions and pays close attention to the prices of parts and doesn't overbuild and put everything in the world in the wrong cost, and a marketing person that knows what the product should look like to be excellent and compelling and what it should look like for what price. Marketing, business, and engineering. It's funny, but in the times when we started Apple, I had such unbelievable engineering skills at what I was doing, not one failure. Every single thing I attacked was a main <laughs> plus job in those early days of Apple. In later days, um, I had a startup once trying to build small, inexpensive, charge the battery once a year device that you could put on a dog and see if it got loose or where it was and failed with the engineering. It wasn't possible. You know, sometimes you attack the impossible, you come up with some clever, clever ideas, and we did, but it doesn't get you to your starting goal that would make it a really great product. Um, ways around that was, well, we just took the product and sold it to um, some um, some government agencies that needed it for a different purpose and <laughs> could pay what it costs. Um, the Apple III computer, we had an Apple II computer taking over the world, running spreadsheets, education, we're just a big company, we're growing, we're you know, so popular, our brand is getting made. And we decided, let's build the next computer, an Apple III, because business market is the bigger market. We'll make the Apple III the business computer, and the Apple II the home computer. But the Apple II had thousands and thousands of pieces of software. Who's gonna buy a computer, a new computer with no software? So we made the Apple III a hybrid. A switch made it boot up as an Apple II or as an Apple III. For some reason, I wasn't involved. I think I would have found a way to make them compatible. <laughs> they still run the Apple II software, but, but um, some people like to make their own thing. Anyway, <laughs> the, the Apple II is only for games, and you have to go to the Apple III. We were trying to push them our way rather than let them choose by something beautiful. And that was a bad marketing mistake. Marketing mistake. I wasn't involved in that. <laughs> Another obstacle was the Lisa computer. We went to Xerox Park and we saw the the, mou the mouses and pushing buttons and menus would pop up and multiple windows at once. Wow! It's like you've got three computers in one. Mm -hmm. I walked out of there feeling once you have that, you'll never go back. It's a one-way door. But 
Steve Jobs thought that we could build this $50,000 machine from Xerox for $1,000. We can always do this Wads magic. And he didn't understand the depth of computer software and computer hardware and his lack of understanding of what made that sort of a computer caused him not to realize that when we built it, it was gonna cost $10,000 to buy. That's $20,000 today. Very expensive, a lot of good software packages. The Lisa computer came out. And that was just due to lack of technical understanding of what it took at that year, what the prices were of parts. The Macintosh was built the same way. It basically didn't have an operating system. It was a program to look like a computer. It was a big oversight and a weakness as to what was needed. And um, it's one reason that for a lot of years, until we got OS 10, we never made the Macintosh a real computer. It had a lot of problems, crashing a lot. But after it was introduced, there was no software. Our stock slid almost to half in a week. It was a very trying time. So that was an obstacle. What do you do when your company's stock, your company's value goes down a third. Board of directors meets and says, what do we do? Well, we thank God we still have millions of dollars flowing in from the Apple II. And Steve Jobs with his Macintosh didn't want to, just wanted to kill a lot of that and try to make the Macintosh force it to be successful and not have any competition in the company. And with no software, the Mac wouldn't have sold. So Steve was wrong. And he was not fired by the company. He left of his own, but he was, he left because his relationship with the people there was so bad, he couldn't really have built the next computer in Apple, even though he would have been well funded for it. Right now, my, my smartphone life is becoming kind of static and expectable. And I think that's happening all around the world to a lot of companies that are in that business of making smartphones. And it's not compelling though, I have to change, I have to have something new desperately. But so emotional, when I feel things emotionally, oh, I want that, oh, I've gotta be the first, um, it results in sales, at least to me. So, virtual reality, every time I try on virtual reality and do it, my gosh, I come out dizzy. I, I mean, I can't believe I was driving a rover around Mars, you know. And um, so I think virtual reality is a big one. Augmented re reality has so much promise in fields of training and all that. It hasn't hit the mainstream yet. But augmented reality apps, I mean, Pokemon Go, but I've got ones, you know, you just hold it up and it shows you every flight that's in the sky. And I love a lot of augmented reality stuff. It's gonna get better. And maybe the HoloLens will be a big part of that. The big future, I think, is artificial intelligence because these computers got so nice when we had a tablet at Apple that you could handwrite with your own muscles, the real human way, handwrite, and it knew the words that you wrote. And I discovered when I wrote Sarah, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m., just to remind myself, it was on a notepad. And I clicked another button called Assist. I didn't know what it would do. It opened up the calendar. Tuesday at 2 p.m., it put the word dentist, and it grabbed Sarah my contact list changed my life forever I want to speak things in the human way and have the machines totally understand me and of course we've got Siri now you've got the Watson machine beating humans at, at games with spoken questions on television and, and helping in so many other ways so many examples where we're getting closer and closer to thinking like a human I mean Google search just replaced a lot of smart people's brains. You used to ask them questions. Now you don't ask a smart person, you just ask Google. I, I like to say you ask somebody whose name starts with G-O, and it's not God. <laughs> the future of money, you know, I would make predictions and they would be wrong as much as they're right. Um, nobody can give you a real clean answer. We have cultures all over the world that have come up with cash and coins, cultures that are coming up with credit cards, cultures that are moving into smartphones. So will money totally go away? Iceland, isn't it Iceland I think, is totally going, um, basically no cash in the near future. It is possible now to do that. It is possible to have everything in the world work in developed countries. So I think it's very logical that why, sort of a hassle to carry money and use money and count it out yourself when really 
here's a product I'm buying, click, and it's paid for somehow automatically. I think the future might be also in a lot of um, retail stores where you do real shopping, because sometimes having things in your hand is better than seeing them online. And doing real shopping and just, you know, put something in your put something in your bin, put something in your bin. When you walk out the door, it knows exactly what's in your bin and it charges you. And you you pay for it. And if you took something out of your bin you aren't charged for it. All automatic is just the nicest thing in the world. Get rid of all the transaction steps you have to do in the middle. Here's an example of that. Used to go to a hotel. And I would, first thing is, I'd wait, wait for a, in a line and get up to reception, and I would check in, and they'd take a lot of information, they would take credit cards, they would do all this, they'd give me a key, and I could go up to my room. But now, at least in the United States, I can check into certain hotels with the SPG app, and I can have the key sent to my phone, and when I arrive, I don't have to talk to anybody. It's all been done, just like Uber. Just like Uber, you don't have to pay the guy at the end of the ride. I'll just go right up the elevator with my phone, right into my room with my phone, and you basically saved a step that wasn't really very useful. Who the heck wants to sit there? Can you give me your credit card information? I'll write it down. Um, you know, well, sometimes they can help you with other things. <laughs> so there's an example, but it's the trend is we're moving towards less and less cash, and we're trying to find a formula. Sometimes formulas don't work when they're found. Um, look, you've got Samsung Pay, you've got Android Pay, you've got Apple Pay, you've got all these other systems. Um, is there going to be one standard like Wi-Fi that works everywhere in the world? That's, that's going to take some time to work out, I think. Remember, we sold the Apple One computer and started a company by building it, and I'm giving away all the IP. Um, at, at, at an early stage, it's hard to say what that's worth. Um, a lot of people in my travels around the world will have the same great idea. Maybe how to extend a social app and make it a little more social or applicable. And I'll find the same idea in a lot of places, but it's young 15-year-olds talking about it. Nobody, until you get down and do the engineering and build the product and actually make something that works, really has um, you know, any, any claim to ideas. I don't believe in just ideas. I believe it's in making the product. That's why when I say you start a company, make sure you've got the engineer with you. And better, do what we did at Apple have a working prototype before you start the company. We started our company and our, our sole source of, of revenues for the first 10 years was one product, the Apple II computer, but we had a working breadboard, a working um, prototype right in front of us. And that, that gives you more, of the, more stake in your company and it's easier to demonstrate how worthy your idea is. Bye-bye, yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>